Hello there. If you are interested in learning about creating concept art in a modern way, especially with all the tools we have available to us today, then I think this video might be something for you. In this video, I'm going to go through my own process, a process that very much reflects how many artists today uh, work. And it's a process that's become somewhat of an industry standard, I would say. But also with that said, every artist is different and there are some key differences in how I approach my work in comparison to others, but also a lot of similarities. At the end of the day, the world of concept art is now so big that you can't cover everything. Um, but I hope this video can help you master concept art. Also, a quick disclaimer before we start. This video is a shortened version of a full 35 hour master course that I created recently. This course is packed with techniques from early sketching to final image and uh, every step in between. And uh, there'll be more info about this course at the end of the video. So concept art is essentially the skill of conveying and explaining an idea through visuals as a stepping stone to a final product. That's it. That's concept art. Concept art is different from classical paintings and illustrations in that its purpose is never to be a product in itself. It's a piece of the exploration on the road to a final product. Now that product could be a game, a film or a comic and so on. But the core idea is that you are trying to convey an idea to the production. Very similar to what an architect does when the blueprints for a building are made, you are figuring everything out before construction happens. Now that is obviously a very broad topic, but commonly today, a lot of concept art is created like this. Firstly, we create some simple sketches or thumbnails. Then we develop those sketches in 3D today, typically in Blender. And then in 3D, we assemble the scenes, we light those scenes and we stage the cinematography. And we can then render those images out and make some final touches in something like Photoshop. And there are a multitude of variations on this workflow, but I would like to share an in-depth look at how I go through this process myself when creating a series of cinematic concept art pieces for a hypothetical fantasy IP. Regardless if I'm working on something for a client or for myself, it always starts with the idea. We need a brief to help guide us. In my mind, the brief is really the most essential thing. Without a solid brief, you are not really solving anything. You're just creating visuals that look good. The whole point of concept art is to convey an idea. So we need that idea. Now, this idea doesn't always have to be the most original idea. It just has to be something concrete. So that is always where I start. I make sure to get into the heart of the story or the world. And then I start to figure out how to best portray what is important. That's the goal. So for this project, the brief consisted of three important facts. What is the main concept we're trying to convey? What is a good way to convey that? And what is the backstory for this concept? If you can answer these three things, well, you are on a strong path. And for me, it looks something like this. My main concept is essentially a desert gate that unlocks the demons of the past. Now, how do I best convey that idea? Now, this is a bit more tricky because it depends on what's important to show. Are we in the state where we need to depict the specifics of this gate? Do we need to look at a lineup of gates or do we need to pitch the entire concept? Depending on what stage you are at in the project, there'll be an optimal way of conveying the idea. And for me, I'm imagining that I really need to pitch this whole area. And personally, then I usually like to portray that in a cinematic lens. I think it's, it's a good way of letting everyone imagine what's going on. I want to present the environment in a filmic way where some sort of action takes place. And here I'm imagining that there are these uh, desert travelers on the back of um, these mounts and they are arriving uh, at this gate. That uh, That is the core idea. And after that, I like to imagine some sort of backstory to help support everything. Now, this step is actually really, really important to me. Now, my backstory is a little bit long here, but essentially it boils down to this. A long time ago, there were demons and wraiths terrorizing the world, but two immortal brothers fought them off and sealed them behind this gate. 
Now this backstory acts as a source of inspiration to guide a lot of the decision making in the design process. I now know that these demons were sealed by two brothers, so why not depict them in the design of the gate in some way? That is the kind of decision making that helps fuel the quality of your concept in my opinion. With the idea settled, I think it's now time to gather some references. Again, letting the brief guide you. I always find that less is more, but that also means that you need to put in some effort into finding quality references that you will actually use. After finding some reference, I move into sketching, bridging the ideas and creating a plan. Now for sketching, I actually have a methodology that goes a little bit against the norm, I think. Essentially, if I can avoid sketching, I do. The sketching process for me is the time where I'm figuring out what I need to do so that I can move into 3D as fast as possible with some sort of certainty. And often I can figure out what I need to know just in my mind by thinking about it. And if that's the case, then I don't sketch anything and I just move into 3D. I never, I never want my sketching process to just be me drawing a clear idea I have because then the sketching process isn't really solving anything, it's just me drawing and that becomes inefficient. But that also means that the opposite is true. If there's something that isn't clear, then I will sketch it to figure it out. You might also be familiar with the thumbnail workflow, which essentially is the practice of creating a small black and white thumbnail and then use that as the core reference point for the entire image. Now, this technique is great if the image is important, like for an illustration or a very specific camera shot. However, if you are developing an idea, it might be more limiting than useful as you are constantly trying to match the thumbnail's composition rather than developing the idea itself. It can often make the read of the image more important than what you're actually conveying. And it for sure has its uses and as an exercise, it is fundamental to developing your skills, but I wouldn't say it's always the right tool for developing all concept art. It very much depends on what you are defining. For this project, I did some very light sketching to figure out what I didn't know, like what kind of area is it? Is it a gate inserted in a wall? Is it down a corridor? Is it on a mountain? It's just a very fast and simple decision making process here where I'm trying different ideas out and I'm not really wasting any time doing values. I'm just drawing and being very literal. The final sketches here are very simple, but they serve their purpose, which is the important bit. And I could probably have done them in my mind, but for the sake of the course, it was nicer to show the process. The gate, however, is the central piece in this project. And I imagined it as being complex, detailed and elaborate, something very much like Hell's Gate, uh, sculpted by Rodin. And because of all this complexity, I was expecting it to be quite a lot of work in 3D. So I thought maybe doing a little bit of preliminary sketching for the gate specifically uh, would uh, serve me well here. So I moved into doing some door variations where I'm figuring out the details. And here the goal is to make the gate like 85% there, kind of, to minimize the time I spent playing around in 3D so I can just execute. But once again, it's about being concrete and precise for me. More so than doing good lighting and rendering, I want to understand the specifics of the gate itself. I ended up doing a couple of variations and decided on this gate as the one I was the most excited about. And very similar to the gate, we have these travelers riding desert creatures that also need to be made in 3D. And to help that execution process, I decided to sketch them out as well. It started with the desert creatures, which essentially ended up becoming something camel-like, but with a horn. I then looked a lot at camel riders and the gear they use. I learned a lot about how the creatures are actually mounted, something I really benefited from as I went into the actual sculpting and modeling process. I also did a full character concept for the characters, nothing very elaborate, but a good foundation and reference to build from in, uh, in 3D. I imagined these riders as mysterious alchemists and found it appropriate to give them a golden mask to make them seem more mystical. And I kind of decided that the mask was a more crucial and essential part of the design. So I sketched that one out specifically to have a solid reference, just like the gate. And then when I have all my ideas somewhat concrete, either in my head or as a sketch, I can confidently move into 3D to begin the next part. I think for me, it makes sense to start with the most essential thing for the project. And uh, in this case, I think that would be the gate. However, looking at the design of the gate, it's going to require a lot of people. And there are many ways of going about this. We could sculpt everything, but that sounds like it would be way too much time. And we're doing concept art, so speed is usually a part of the equation. 
Instead, I was hoping to hit two birds with one stone and decided to rig a human base model. By rigging a human base model, I could use it to pose a bunch of characters and then sculpt on top of them. And then later on, I could use that same rig as the base for our characters, which felt quite neat. When I had a rigged character, it was very easy to block out the big parts of the gate. And in addition to that, I also morphed a skull into the design and uh, other details here and there. When I have all that, I can essentially sculpt on top of everything to give it character. After I had the gate, I quickly created a simple frame and gave it some simple textures and shaders. I'm kind of glancing over how I made the gate here, but there's actually a lot of steps involved in creating uh, the gate itself, a lot of different techniques, uh, which all is detailed in the course, of course. But after this, I went into creating some simple cliff walls uh, around the gate itself. And here I actually used sculpting uh, instead. And I think this process actually is pretty interesting. Whilst you could use a lot of scans, pre-made cliff assets from libraries like Megascans and so on, more and more I avoid doing that. Sometimes for me it has created an over-reliance on good scans to make nice looking environments. And I'm also cheating myself out on developing good skills to actually make assets on my own. And if ever I needed to make something custom or stylized, then scans wouldn't really get me that far. And therefore I think this approach really works for me because I like working across a multitude of subjects and styles. However, if you know you are gonna be working on a project set in the desert of Utah or something similar, then use the scans. It will you know, speed up your workflow immensely. Just don't make yourself over-reliant, I would say. At this point, I was trying to develop a feel for what the right place was for the concept. I was juggling between a corridor and a wall, but ended up going with the idea of a wall as it just seemed more imposing somehow. Once I had a little bit of the environment developed, I wanted to move into doing the characters. For the character, I reused the rig I made for the gate. And since the character had very baggy clothes, I decided to simulate all the clothing by creating simple clothing and then just letting it fall. Blender is not as good as Marvelous Designer for tasks like this, but if you play around with it a bit, you can get some neat results, I think, especially in combination with the cloth sim brushes in sculpt mode, but I will show you that a little bit later. I also used sculpting to create the mask to get that handcrafted feel, and then I went to Polyhaven to gather textures to use for everything. Nothing very complicated to place here. I would say there are just a few techniques to get good enough UVs fast, especially for concepting. Rigging the cloth is always one of the hardest tasks to undertake, I think. It never really looks great when the cloth is rigged. However, I was planning on creating a little character library with unique poses, and I want to solve the clothing in a different way. Once again, I will show you that a bit later. So after I had the character made, I wanted to move on to creating the camel creature. Now, in the full course, I wanted to go through the entire creation process for a creature. So. That's what I did, and that's far too much to show right now, uh, but it's there in the course. Uh, but basically, I started out sculpting the entire creature. And even though it's camel-like, I didn't use any pre-existing base. Because the idea is really that I should be able to make anything with this technique. And when I have the creature fully sculpted, I can move into texturing the creature using the sculpt vertex colors. Very, very nice. But in order to pose the creature and make it more dynamic, I would have to rig it. And for that, I kind of want some better topology. And I was also thinking about grooming the creature. And for that, you also need UVs. So I might as well retopologize the creature. I have a fairly fast way of doing retopology. Uh, of course, if you have access to something like C-Remesh in C-Rush, you can use that. But my method worked for me and only takes about an hour. Once all that is set up, I can bake the sculpt colors to actual textures and create a decent shader for the camel as well. And then if you wouldn't believe it, I go and rig the whole thing. Rigging it is really one of those skills that scare a lot of people, I think, because it looks quite technical, but you can learn most of it in a week, no problem. And it's just such a useful tool. So at this point, I've been doing it so much, I really don't mind rigging things anymore. And I think, honestly, this camel took about 30 minutes to rig. And uh, so it's really not that bad. I had actually concepted the camel with longer hair, so I used the new hair system to groom the camel. The new hair system is for sure not as simple and straightforward as the old one, but it does have more flexibility and is more performant, so good for concept. I also created assets for the creature to match some of the stuff a camel usually carries, like a saddle and some cloth. Now this brought me to a really interesting part of this process, creating 
the asset library. I think for any project of this size that I do, I end up creating a small asset library of elements that I reuse. For this specific project, I want to create a bunch of shots. So I would need a bunch of characters and camels in different poses. And to keep everything light and flexible, I will make static meshes out of my rigged characters. This gives me another advantage as it lets me re-sculpt some of the elements of the characters because they will no longer be rigged. And specifically, I want to use the cloth simulation brush for this. To create a new pose character, I start out posing the character with the rig. Then once I have the pose, I duplicate and combine everything to keep it simple and apply everything to make it a normal mesh. Then I have the freedom to sculpt on that character and fix little intersections where the rigging wasn't perfect. And there the cloth sim brush is really great. It allows me to deform the cloth without actually stretching it. Instead, it maintains its dimensions and creates folds and bends, making everything look more natural. It is by no means perfect and you have to wrestle it a little bit and combine it with the normal grab brush, but it does help finish the look on a lot of the clothing especially for the unique poses. And this is just not something you will get from a simple rig. To get this level of clothing, you would have to simulate it. And that would be too complicated and heavy for concepting, in my opinion, at least for my workflow. Then I just do this for all the character poses and for the camel as well, which means I end up with a little asset library, which I can then go ahead and add to Blender's asset browser. With all the assets set up, I can bring them into my scene. And for me, this is really the most crucial and most fun part of the entire concept process. At this point, I'm essentially creating a little narrative for myself of these travelers arriving at this gate. And it just really helps to visualize and imagine everything as a film for me. I think that's just really the way I naturally see things. So the goal right now is to take our character assets in combination with the sets and then start filming everything through cinematic cameras and then create these moments. And I think it's important to remember here that we are trying to create uh, this piece as a way of pitching the entire area or this entire moment to someone else. And I think using a cinematic angle with a bit of story is the right way to go about that. When making these shots and compositions, I think a lot about having good variations of close-ups and far away shots, but also having dynamic versus flat compositions. And I think in all projects, a central key shot usually develops, something that represents everything that this place is really about. And for me, that became the central door shot with all the riders in front. It really frames the gate in an awesome way and it kind of captivates the essence of the story, the riders arriving at this impressive uh, gate to hell. At this point, iteration really becomes key. I start out creating lots of shots, then I slowly select fewer and fewer, trying to hit roughly five total shots to then develop further. When I then have my selection of five, I then start polishing the area and the lighting of each shot, uh, really polishing them out. I think I vary a lot in how shot versus environment oriented I am with each project. But that I mean, do I really try to nail the entire environment with the assets, polish and detail before I start photographing everything? Or do I set up the camera and then just block everything out? I think a rule of thumb for me personally is to have the opportunity to move around in my environment and pretend to be a photographer. If my environment can let me have fun with that, it usually is good enough in terms of details for me. But creating too many details can also be a problem, especially for performance, and maybe you're creating details in areas where you don't need them, so you really have to find a balance uh, between the two. As I flesh out the area more and more, I often create little geometry node setups for scattering rocks or making grass. Geometry nodes have really become an essential part of my tools now, and it honestly doesn't take that long to set up a simple scattering setup, and you can use it in such creative ways. As I was making the project, I learned a lot about the new hair system and ended up using it to create grass, and it was honestly very, very effective, and I could see myself using it more and more. I think most often the very final thing I tweak is always light. Lighting. lighting is something you really want to be perfect. And I took a while to just perfect the light shapes as much as possible. And it also very elegantly leads into the next part of the process, which is rendering the shots out. 
Now I have a pretty elaborate process for rendering out my shots and I've seen so many different approaches. Some people just create simple 3D blockouts and then do the rest in 2D. Others create everything in 3D to the last detail and then the shot is finished and they don't need to pull it into Photoshop. However, like I said earlier, I like to work across a whole bunch of different styles and subject matters, which just means that sometimes I have to pull it into Photoshop. So, so my philosophy often revolves around finding a workflow not a style, but a workflow that kind of encompasses everything. And that usually comes down to something like this. Develop the idea, build it in 3D, render it out, and finish it in 2D. And now that sounds pretty simple, but these four steps will change depending on the style and the subject matter. But thinking like that helps me prepare and handle each step on a technical level. And many times I've tried creating the final result in 3D or making simple blockouts to then paint more in 2D. But I think over the years, I realized that those are just very different skills. If you have to create something that's essentially a final image in 3D, then you have to work with a very different level of detail and a different level of polish and you have to work with a different level of compositing and color in 3D. And I also think that unfinished 3D can look a lot worse than unfinished 2D. 2D can be a little bit more loose and sketchy and have brush strokes. And I think at least for clients, a certain aesthetic associated with it where it implies development, uh, whereas a 3D blockout can look unpolished, even though it's under development. I hope you get what I'm saying. Basically, I think if 2D is unfinished, then it's a bit more forgivable. It's like, oh, that's clearly in development where if something is just a 3D blockout, it can look like, oh, but why isn't it finished as opposed to being in development? I've at least experienced uh, that before where it's not as clear to a client or to whoever's working for the work. Either way, to get back on track, at this point, I'm ready to render everything out. And as I said, I have a rather complicated process for that. I use Blender's compositor and render out a whole bunch of render passes to automatically use in Photoshop. I think these passes are very important to have to have an effective workflow in 2D, and they can be used in all kinds of ways. And one of the key things here is rendering out the cryptomats with the correct normalization so you can actually get the full range of colors. A common problem I see and a mistake I've made myself many times in the past. With my setup, I get all the passes every time I render automatically saved to my drive, which is very neat. If I have any kind of adjustment to the 3D, then I just render all the passes and they are updated. Then from there, it's pretty much bring it all into Photoshop and start polishing the final image. And I use a bunch of techniques here, mostly grounded in some light photo bashing, readjusting lighting and values and making a few corners more painterly. Making stuff more painterly is not just a way of hiding ugly details, but it can be used as a powerful tool to help focus in on something. It's sort of the painter's tool for creating depth of field. You have areas that are more loose and chaotic and some areas that are more tight and clear, which creates a very natural focal for the viewer. And here we have the final master image. Quite a journey to get to this point, but also quite the result. Personally, I'm very happy with where I got and I would just like to take a few minutes to properly explain what this course actually contains. So this course is called Mastering Concept Art and it comprises 35 hours of content divided into 36 videos. The course is very much an in-depth look at creating concept art in a modern way. I go through the sketching process, the initial block out, the modeling, sculpting and texturing, all of it, all the way to creating the final image in Photoshop. It is by far the biggest course I've ever made and the biggest course I will possibly ever make. But I think what is unique and cool about it is the amount of skills you can add to your tool belt in a cohesive way. And on top of everything you might expect from a concept artist, I go through rigging, geometry nodes, sculpting, grooming, and many other things that can give you the variety of tools you often need to be an effective concept artist. And to be completely honest, if you are a complete beginner, then I don't think this is the course for you. However, if you already dabbled in making concept art in Blender or are making concept art in Blender, then I think this course might be really valuable. In this course, I only use Blender and Photoshop and free assets. I'm not using Quixel, Megascans, any paid texture libraries, no Blender add-ons, nothing extra. It's just kept simple. So everything should be very accessible. The course is available right now over on my website at criticalgiants.com slash store. Links in the description. I really hope it will be worth your while. It really is a course that encompasses years of knowledge building and I'm pretty excited about it.